um, on this afternoon uh, for this um, important and, and popular uh, topic, a private docks proposed over salt marsh or eelgrass, evaluating their impacts. Um, so many of you have, have come out and expressed interest in it, and we're looking forward to hearing from four speakers this, this afternoon. And um, before uh, we, we get into um, uh, announcing our speakers and introducing them, I want to just cover uh, a few of the usual housekeeping items. If you've been uh, uh, joining us, you, you're uh, more than likely could recite this as well as I can, but um, all of you are muted. Background noise can be a problem during these platform uh, meetings. So uh, you are auto muted um, unless the instructor does uh, call on someone or ask for uh, mics to be unmuted. Um, uh, will remain muted and you will um, please uh, filter your question, questions and comments and feedback and interactions through the chat box. Um, we'll be keeping an eye open for that. Um, uh, they will be facilitating the questions and if something gets missed, uh, I'll uh, have an eye open for it. Um, if you haven't already, please type your name and affiliation into the chat box so that our speakers know who you are, where you're from. Um, if you are on this uh, uh, workshop and you are looking to get uh, a CEU credit for it, um, please remain uh, in the class for the entire duration. Um, if you need to leave uh, at the end of the hour, um, we understand, just uh, please send me a message and let me know. Um, I also want to let folks know if you've got peripheral applications such as Outlook running in the background, uh, any other kind of applications like that, close them out. Um, it helps with um, having the, uh, the, the platform run smoothly. You won't get that gargled uh, voice and freezing of, uh, of cameras. So um, we do have a sponsor for this workshop. And um, I am going to, I always have a problem with this for some reason. Um, there we go. Um, I want to give a shout out, a huge shout out to Mass Environmental Trust. They have been uh, a longtime supporter of MACC in funding a lot of the education programs that we do. Um, and uh, if you're not quite familiar with uh, Mass Environmental Trust, um, look them up online. Of course, they are. Um, a lot of their funding comes from the license plates that you see in front of you. Um, and I believe um, they are going to be coming out with another license plate uh, in the future, um, very near future. Um, their fun, uh, funds and coordinate, they fund and coordinate projects to restore, protect, and improve the quality of mass waterways. Um, they obviously uh, promote educational uh, experiences such as this, uh, where um, the environment uh, and human intersection, um, you know, come together. Um, and they're very involved in a lot of the environmental uh, aspects of Massachusetts. Um, here again, uh, here's the uh, website, but you can just go to um, uh, uh, MET. Uh, we've also got a link on our homepage um, and on the conference website that you can um, visit. They uh, obviously award grants. Um, Saving the Whales plate, which is one of their most popular. Uh, of course, we, lo we love our, our whales and um, look to uh, protect a lot of the endangered species, our, our brooks and uh, our uh, cold water fisheries want to make sure that they are protected. Uh, Blackstone Valley, uh, which is down in my area where I am from, um, has gone through quite a bit of, of cleanup. Um, uh, they have been a huge part of that. Um, and uh, here's their bass conservation uh, plate. Um, and uh, most importantly, they uh, help fund uh, MACC's 2018 buffer zone guidebook. Uh, which if you do not have, you can purchase it through MACC's online store and um, you can um, 
uh, view this wonderful uh, buffer zone book um, that has all sorts of um, information on permitting in the buffer zone. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to Jeremy, my co-host, to introduce our instructors. All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce the four speakers that we have with us today. I'm going to start off with Jill Carr, who's an environmental analyst at Mass Base National Estuary Partnership. Uh, she specializes in the development of monitoring programs that track changes to water quality and coastal habitats. She also works with monitoring groups to build their technical capacity and increase the use of their data by decision makers. After that, we also have Barbara Warren with us today, a Salem Sound Coast Watch Executive Director and Lower North Shore Mass Base Regional Coordinator. She's led scientifically robust water quality sampling, habitat restoration, and community engagement for over 20 years in the Salem Sound watershed. In addition to that, we have Caitlin Frew, who is an environmental analyst at the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, where she provides technical review of coastal construction projects on the North Shore and conducts habitat restoration projects, including eelgrass and artificial reefs. And last is Dr. John Logan, an environmental analyst with Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries as well. He provides technical review of coastal construction pro projects on the South Shore and conducts fisheries and habitat research with a focus on salt marsh and highly migratory fish species. And on that note, um, I will leave it to them to take away with it. Great, thank you so much, Joey and Jeremy for the introductions and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're so happy to have you here um, on this important topic. A brief outline about what we'll talk about for the next hour. Um, I'm Jill Carr from Mass Bays and I'll be talking about um, an overview of the habitats we're discussing today and the current regulatory language. Kate's gonna take over with DMF environmental review data and trends that they've seen. John is going to share the results of two salt marsh studies he recently conducted and some um, forthcoming uh, BMP guidance documents that will be available to you soon. And then Barbara is going to share with us information about a, a scientific eelgrass study that she has planned for next year and some outreach associated with that. Uh, regarding Q&A, we have so much to cover today and um, so much technical information and I'm sure lots of great conversation to come from it. So please use that chat box um, as much as you like. Uh, don't save your questions in your head until the end because we don't want to miss anything. So feel free to use that as we go. So an overview of the habitats we're discussing. We're in the coastal zone here um, in the gradient from the uplands to the subtitle area. Up at the higher elevations, we have the high salt marsh, higher salt marsh. Um, we'll have salt grass and marsh grass in that area. Uh, it's inundated only a couple times a year or a couple times a month with those highest tides. Lower in the marsh is called the lower marsh. Uh, it's often the taller cord grass species. This area is inundated a couple times a day with the high tides, uh, but spends a lot of time dry as well. So salt marsh plants are almost always above um, the low tide line. Once you get below the low tide line, you're in the subtidal area. So these plants are always submerged, at least in Massachusetts. Uh, we have subtidal eelgrass here. It's very similar to land plants and um, has actually evolved from land plants. So all of these plants, just like the grass in your lawn, um, require sunlight for photosynthesis. The benefits that they provide to us uh, are great and many. Obviously, the fishing opportunities, um, they create a great deal of fisheries habitat and recreational potential. They enhance biodiversity, reduce storm energy and wave energy, stabilize the sediments and protect from erosion, and they store carbon and nutrients, which cleans and filters the water column, and ultimately providing shelter and forage for many important commercially and recreationally important fish species. The problem we're here to discuss uh, is the development of structures over these habitats. As you can imagine, any vegetation that requires light to photosynthesize and create its own energy um, will be hampered by any kind of uh, reduction or covering of that light. 
So impacts from a dock or a float over these habitats can uh, have several different impacts, including shading-induced habitat loss. So the habitat might, habitat might be lost entirely or just reduced in biomass. You can have direct habitat loss that's from the footprint of structures being placed in the habitat itself, such as pilings and the associated impacts from those. So for example, a piling has its actual uh, measurable footprint, but then there's usually a halo around each piling uh, where you have a great deal of scouring and erosion and vegetation can't survive. And then of course there's use-related impacts. And the most common use-related impact of a dock and float system is at the float end. So that's all the way to the right end of the screen. Um, and that's where you have vessels tied up, sometimes many vessels that can contribute to the shading impacts. But then there's also the use of those vessels. Um, just by using th the propeller, it can create a great deal of turbidity, or if the vessel is sitting low enough, it can actually rip up the vegetation right out of the water, out of the sediment, excuse me. And there's other use-related impacts, such as uh, petroleum products, um, boat cleaning, supplies and other chemicals that can enter the water body from using a boat. Currently in the regulations um, pertaining to structures over eelgrass and salt marsh in the Wetlands Protection Act, CMR 10, eelgrass is mentioned just once um, in the regulations. And it says there, if a project is water dependent, it must minimize adverse effects. If non-water dependent, have no adverse effects on eelgrass. Um, there is a lot of vague language there that is not further defined, um, and it leaves a lot open to interpretation of project proponents and also reviewers, um, including the term minimize and the term adverse. They're not well defined here. Uh, and what we've seen in practice is the, that vagueness leaves the door wide open um, to interpretations that result in loss of habitat. Salt, march, salt marshes have a much more robust presence in the Wetlands Protection Act regs. They have an entire section to themselves. Um, and those regs go on to say that a project in salt marsh or within a buffer or in a body of water adjacent to salt marsh shall not destroy any portion or have adverse effects on productivity of the salt marsh, which does sound highly protective. However, it goes on to say that a small project like an elevated walkway that has no adverse effects other than blocking sunlight may be permitted, um, which is problematic because that blocking sunlight piece is really critical to, um, to whether or not there is an adverse effect. Currently, uh, there are a handful of towns in Massachusetts that have taken regulations a step farther. Um, for whatever reason, they, they find the resources in their town or the interest in their town uh, worthy of greater protection that's that's provided in the Wetlands Protection Act. So they've included language in their bylaws to further protect the habitats. And I'm just going to summarize some examples here um, in case you're wondering what kind of language uh, could maybe be amended into your own town bylaws. Here, there should be some examples here. In Plymouth, the language states that other than for improvement dredging, no adverse effect or eelgrass on eelgrass or other submerged aquatic vegetation is permitted. So that's no adverse effect. In several towns, uh, there's no new replacement or substantial repairs of docks within 50 feet of eelgrass. Several towns have specific survey requirements. So for any project, they wanna see eelgrass within 75 to 200 feet of the site delineated. And I thought it was interesting that Wareham went on to specify that surveys must be done during the summer, which is a great addition. Um, eelgrass and salt marsh will change greatly during the dormant winter months. Some towns are targeting that light component because of how important it is. In Falmouth, light can be reduced no more than 50% under a structure. And in Mashpee, structures need to be designed to minimize the shading. In terms of areas of critical environmental concern, no, no new docks there in Orleans. And in Falmouth, they can be permitted if providing public benefit. In Bourne, all floats are required to be seaward of wetlands, salt marshes, or eelgrass which is great. Um, we do think that the floating portion, the float end is probably the most impactful if it's placed over vegetation since it sits right above it. In Nahant, they uh, have permitted ducks and uh, other structures over eelgrass and salt marsh, but do require monitoring and then mitigation if a loss is determined. 
And they've also in Nahant set several um, size and dimensional type restrictions within their bylaws. And this is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there are others. Um, and also there are some that are some towns that are currently trying to develop those bylaws as we speak. Something interesting that a couple towns have done, they have used zoning to get at uh, some natural resource protection rather than going through the wetlands protection bylaws. So this is an interesting method of dealing with, a pro of, with that problem. Uh, Marion um, went through an exercise of developing a water sheet zoning model. So that was really extending the zoning laws for each coastal parcel out over the water sheet. Um, and they were seeing a real problem with sprawl of uh, each individual parcel along the coast wanting their own docks and floats. Um, and these parcels were very small, stacked right up against each other. So they developed this zoning model that would um, give a very clear cut yes or no if a parcel were allowed to develop over the water sheet. That was never actually passed in Marion, um, but in Barnstable, something similar was passed and has been in place for a long time called the Recreational Shellfish Overlay Districts. So this again is worked into their zoning law and it focused really more on public access and their very robust shell fishing industry they have there. But what's nice is that it did indirectly capture protection for salt marsh and eelgrass in some spots. So just something to think about, these are options for additional resource protection. The Army Corps of Engineers at the federal level does also regulate for activities in eelgrass and salt marsh. What you're seeing here is a screenshot of their general permit three structures and navigable waters. So if an applicant is proposing a project uh, that fits all of the highlighted um, conditions here in terms of size and dimensions of the structure, they don't actually need a formal permit with review. They just need to send in a, a form. Um, that's why it's called self-verification. However, if they're outside of these conditions, they're going to have to go through full project review at the core, which involves agents, multiple agencies commenting and so on. And um, we, we've seen a, a great deal of projects come through that go beyond these conditions and have been reviewed. And I'm gonna show you an example of one of those projects because it actually ended up resulting in a, a somewhat successful ending. So what you're seeing here is a small stretch of the Marblehead coastline. This is along Bradley Street. And you'll see two existing uh, residential piers reaching out from the coastline here. And interestingly, uh, this is a, an April photo, so you don't see the gangways and floats out in the water yet, still um, late, late winter, early spring. But interestingly, you can sort of see an area here on the left-hand pier uh, where there's prob some probable impact from a float. Um, you can see the, the shading scar from uh, the float that used to sit there. So essentially what was proposed here, oh, and quickly I'll just show you approximately where the eelgrass exists. So that's shown in red here. Between those two red lines is uh, where eelgrass existed according to a 2016 survey. And what was proposed along this coastline, two additional neighbors wanted to also build their own private piers into the same eelgrass bed. Now this is a great deal of impact for four very closely located neighbors to each have their own pier. Um, both of the proposed piers uh, went through the CONCOM. The CONCOM in Marblehead did deny the projects, uh, but that, however, they uh, appealed to DEP and both were successful and granted their projects. However, because they didn't meet the conditions of the Army Corps general permit self-verification, they had to have the full review um, by all of the agencies. And during that process, um, it, was, it was great. A lot of agencies came together and said, this is a real problem here. And ultimately, the Army Corps was able to request these develop these um, proponents work together and develop instead a shared single shared pier. Uh, so that's what's currently proposed. Um, and this pier, while it does have impacts to eelgrass, um, it's less than than uh, having two um, nearly identical piers stretching out into eelgrass. And furthermore. This actually extends the pier further across the eelgrass to get the float the floating end almost to the seaward edge. Um, so there were a lot of successes about this. Of course, still some negatives, um, but I wanted to share that with you guys. Obviously, this identifies a need for more research. We do want um, some hard data to be able to inform any amendments to DEP's regulations, 
and also to help CONCOMs defend any bylaws that they want to adopt. We do see preliminary evidence that there are shading impacts, but we need that to be in more solid, digestible science. And just to show you what that evidence of shading looks like, here's an example of um, DMF side scan sonar survey. It takes a little to, to train your eye to see what we're looking at here, but all of those gray tiles, and we're in the same little stretch of coastline we were in a moment ago, each of those gray tiles is an image generated from a, a sonar. Um, so you can imagine a, a boat traveling kind of along the center line of, the, of those tiles with a sonar device over the edge of the boat sending sound out to each side of the boat about 100 feet away. It pings the sound out and sound pings back and from that return the device is able to draw a picture, create an image of what the seafloor looks like. And what eelgrass looks like in this image is sort of this cloud-like texture. You can sort of follow the shallow edge here. It's a little bit fluffy texture as opposed to more shallow areas. These are flat, um, cobbly, rocky areas. Further out from the eelgrass, this is featureless sand with some rocks and mooring blocks and things like that. So again, here's that eelgrass line. And what I wanted to point out to you here is the detection of um, no eelgrass where those floats sit. So over here on the left-hand pier, there's a large um, shading area. And over here on the right-hand side, a smaller shading area. So we're just beginning to understand ways of detecting these impacts. And the last thing I wanna share with you is um, an example of why we really should care. This is right around the corner from uh, that stretch we were just looking at, also in Marblehead. So these are three residential piers, one right after another. Again, you're looking at the side scan sonar imagery. And in red, we see eelgrass. So this meadow used to be one continuous long band of eelgrass, um, but now it's kind of been fragmented and segmented into these smaller little pocket beds. That's a problem um, because these small beds are not nearly as resilient as a larger continuous bed. Uh, they're less likely to hang on in the face of um, climate change and um, worsening weather conditions. So something to keep in mind when we're talking about a cumulative impact of many neighbors one right after another developing in this way. So now that you've heard my piece of good news, I'm going to pass it on to Kate. Excuse me, uh, Jill? Yes. There was a question um, from Janet. Was the cumulative, cumulative impact on eelgrass the basis for the Marblehead CONCOM's denial? Uh, it, it, was, it was part of it. This was actually, that project was the first of about um, five or six that followed that were very similar. Um, so it, it wasn't necessarily um, cumulative impact at that point, but now they're certainly thinking in those terms. Um, I think the Marblehead Conservation Commission was getting a lot of feedback from the agencies during project review and started to realize the importance of specifically their eelgrass bed right there um, being some of the last that exists in Salem Harbor in that location. Great, thank you. Sure. All right, well, thanks, Jill. And um, yeah, we're really excited to be here and uh, present on this topic. So I'm gonna be talking about DMF's environmental review process a little bit and what our data trends are um, over the past few years. And I'm just working on getting to the next slide. There we go. All right, so um, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries Habitat Program reviews coastal alteration projects through various stages of permitting. And we provide comments to the below permitting agencies. Um, and the primary purpose of our review is to assess a project's potential impacts to marine fisheries resources and habitats and, and, um, and provide recommendations on ways these projects can avoid, minimize, or to mitigate for those adverse impacts on these resources. So we don't issue permits um, and we really depend on the permitting agencies. So on the Conser Conservation Commission, um, you folks, so thanks for attending this talk. Um, we find it really, we really depend on you guys to kind of relay why these habitats are important. And if you can kind of work with the applicants who are proposing projects in these important habitats and try to find ways um, to avoid and then minimize and then mitigate these impacts. 
So um, to stay organized with our project re re review, we review a lot of projects. <laughs> um, so we've been maintaining an, a database since the early 2000s and each project that we review um, gets its own unique identification number. And then um, we keep track of kind of like the project location, uh, what our comments are, what, what different permits the projects received, um, that kind of thing. But around 2010, we started asking some of these questions during our review process. So what projects are we reviewing most often? Um, how, how much of our time and energy are we spending on some of these different project types? Are there any project hotspots? Uh, what habitats are being impacted and how much? Um, what about indirect impacts? And then what are the cumulative impacts from all of, all of these different projects? And that's what this talk, uh, my section of this talk is going to focus on these questions and uh, try to answer some of these questions for you folks. So how do we answer some of these questions? Well, in 2013, we transitioned to an access database and started tracking additional project information. So now we record um, the latitude and longitude of each project. And this allows us to um, tie in our access database uh, to ArcGIS or Google Earth and kind of create maps. And I'll show some of these maps later in my talk but these maps really give a great visual for where project hotspots are and kind of see where the cumulative impacts are happening. And then a little bit harder to kind of record and track are impacts. So like Jill mentioned previously, um, we try to record the permanent direct impacts. So again, just to kind of re, um, restate what Jill kind of went over, we look at the square footage of the actual structure that's displacing any habitat. So the square footage of piles, um, the footprint of maybe a float that's resting on the bottom. So if we think so, sometimes a float is, um, being applied or being go, going through the permitting process and it's it's not maybe high enough off of eelgrass that we would like it to be. So we kind of look at that footprint. Um, so that's the permanent direct impact. But more recently, we're starting to record the entire shading impact um, of a dock structure because like Jill said, um, shading really impacts salt marsh and eelgrass, so that would be the entire footprint of the dock. So the ducking, the gangway, and the float. And I'll talk more about the impacts, these impacts a little later in my talk. And then we also record the project types. And again, I'll talk more about these later. And then we record the habitat types. And this talk is really going to focus um, on eelgrass and salt marsh impacts. I kind of just wanted to give you guys an overview of different resources we use at DMF on a weekly or if not daily basis and how to locate habitat. So if you ever have any questions and want to kind of do this on your own too, um, Bing, Bing Maps and Google Earth are really user friendly and just kind of give you a great visual of a project site, kind of like you're doing a little site visit. And Google Earth has a great tool that's a historical imagery tool and you can see a site over um, different years. So it's really nice to be able to see how a site has transformed over the um, over time. And then um, this is a screenshot of Morris. If you're not familiar with Morris, this is CZM's online mapping tool. And this they provide a bunch of different types of base maps and layers such as shellfish layers or wetlands layers. And again, that's really user-friendly. Um, and then a little bit more complex is ArcGIS. And if you don't have access to ArcGIS desktop, you can use ArcGIS Online, which is a free version, and you can download data from MassGIS. So on the right is an example of a map I created um, using some of the DEP layers. So you'll see the eelgrass layer in green, and then the DEP wetlands layer with highlighting salt marsh in orange. Um, we're here to answer any questions you ever have about these resources too, or um, these different sites. And so you can feel free to email me at any time to learn more about these uh, resources. But I also want to note that we do have our in-house biologists. So our habitat team specializes in eelgrass and salt marsh, but then we also will reach out to our diadromous biologists and shellfish biologists when we have questions about a certain project. So um, like I mentioned, we can create maps from our access database and I'll be showing some maps that I created in ArcGIS. But the rest of my talk will be focusing on our review period between 2015 and 2019. 
So just in this five year period, DMF has reviewed close to 2000 projects. That's about um, 400 projects a year. And basically you'll, you'll see a lot of green points because <laughs> there's been so many projects all over Massachusetts, um, wherever there's an opportunity for a project or there has been something proposed. And um, just kind of the downside of our database is that we are we are just tracking what projects have been have applied for a permit. So we don't necessarily know if one of these projects has, has happened, if it, what year it happened in, um, if it's been constructed or not. So we're hoping eventually we'll be able to do that, but right now we just don't have the resources to do that. So just wanted to make a note of that. Um, and then what projects are we reviewing most often and spending the most time reviewing? Um, and this graph kind of answers that question. So in the past, so in the, that five year period, we reviewed almost 600 private dock applications, um, about 400 hard shoreline projects. And those include anything from like a seawall project to something including some kind of riprap or a bulkhead project. We reviewed just under 200 commercial docks. And I'll kind of get into the difference between what I mean between a commercial dock and a private dock um, in the next slide. And then we review just under 150, we've reviewed just under 150 dredge projects. So every year, these are the projects that we're reviewing the most often. And now DMF is in the process of trying to conduct more research to really understand, like kind of Jill, like Jill mentioned, really understand what these impacts are um, and come up with better guidelines and best management practices um, to recommend ways to avoid, minimize, and mitigate these impacts. So are there any project hotspots? And this is a map that shows this, that same five-year period, but just focusing on private and commercial docks. And like I mentioned, just under 600 private docks, those are represented by the blue points and just under 200 commercial um, docks. And those are um, represented by the red points. So when I'm talking about commercial docks, that includes uh, piers and wharfs, and you'll see a lot a lot of projects like those we review in and around Boston. Um, and commercial docks also include marinas or any kind of public access point like a boat ramp or um, a public fishing pier. But the rest of my talk is going to focus on private docks. So this is an example of a private dock in Wareham, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But I just, just want to include um, this visual to show almost 800 docks in five year period. So that's a lot of, a lot of docks. And then this map kind of focuses more, well, it does just focus more on private docks in Massachusetts in that five year period for application for permit applications. So just under 600, again, just under 600 docks. And you'll notice that there's a color gradient for the towns. So the darker shade of red towns have had more permit applications for private docks. Um, and just in towns like on the Cape, uh, Barnstable had just under 70 docks in a five year period. So that's a lot of private docks that are still being applied for. And we're seeing um, heavy amounts of applications along Cape Cod and in and around Buzzards Bay. Um, and so again, anywhere that there's an opportunity for a dot, you'll see a point. But there are some areas of this map where we're not seeing many um, private dock applications. So I just kind of wanted to talk about those areas. So it kind of makes sense in and around Boston. We're not seeing many. Um, there's a lot of commercial and public space. So um, that would make sense. And then along the end of Cape Cod, that's where the Cape Cod National Seashore is. So again, not many opportunities for private docks there. And similarly, up in Ipswich and Rowley area, um, this is the Great Marsh ACEC. And then the strip along Plymouth, where there's a lot of cliffs and um, coastal erosion, you just wouldn't expect someone to, I mean, it wouldn't be smart for someone to put a private dock there. So now that we know where these projects are happening, we can kind of focus a little bit more on what habitats are being impacted by these, by these structures. And so similar to the previous uh, map, this map also has a color gradient. And of the 600 private docks in that five year period, about 45 have occurred in or adjacent to existing eelgrass beds. So um, just how Jill kind of talked about Marblehead, we have seen a slight uptick in the number of permit applications, and you can't even see the town because there's so many blue points. Similar to Marblehead, there's also an issue going on in Westport. This is a map of Main Road in Westport. If you can see it, this is the 
2017 DEP eelgrass layer outlined in red. And then you don't see many dock and piers, but we're seeing more permanent applications along the strip. So like Joe mentioned, this isn't good because it can lead to bag fragmentation. And then similar to the previous slide, this slide focuses on impacts to salt marsh. So the 600 private docks near in that five year period were 246 projects in a near salt marsh. So that's about 40% of the 40% of the private docks in that period. And we're seeing a high uptick again in the Cape along Elmuth, Mashby, Barnstable, um, and some other areas in along Massachusetts coast. And um, these are just examples of what those coast, coastlines will look like when everyone who has a property installs a private dock. So this is, these are docks along the Rowley River on the North Shore. And these are docks along Old Harbor Creek and Sandwich. So it would be great if we just saw one or two community docks in this area. But, um, we're just, we're working more on suggesting that as an, as an option. So um, what about indirect impacts. And we've talked a lot about direct impacts so far, and those are pretty obvious when a project is being proposed, but you don't always think about what the indirect impacts are. And Jill covered these a little, little bit, and you may have seen some of our comment letters include these issues, but um, I think these pictures really help drive home why these, impact, these indirect impacts are a big deal. So in the top left, you can see the impacts to an eelgrass bed in West Valley the Carver from just one boat and this boat has um, two outboard motors and you can just see the scarring it's done um, to this eelgrass bed and that's pretty that's pretty substantial. And then in the bottom left you can see some chain and flexible road dragging through eelgrass and these are pictures from Manchester so even if the flexible road isn't installed properly it can still drag through and rip out eelgrass. And then on the right these are two existing floats in Marblehead and these are above eelgrass beds. So not only do they have a pretty large float footprint, they both have multiple vessels. The picture on the bottom there, you have some jet skis. They both have some swim platforms. So that almost doubles the size of the footprint of the shading impacts to the eelgrass um, beds below. So what are the cumulative impacts? And this is something we've been trying to assess at TMF for a little while, and it's definitely pretty challenging. But I'm gonna to try to do this a couple of different ways um, in this slide. So I'll just walk you through the graphs on top first. So these graphs show in blue, the number of new docks proposed in a single given year. And then in orange, these are the cumulative number of docks from the additional years. So on the left, you'll see docks near eelgrass. So in one given year, there could be seven or seven to 13 um, from applications for docks, which don't sound like a lot, but after five years, that's 45 docks. So it definitely adds up after a couple of years. And similarly on the right, these are docks near Salt Marsh. So again, about 41 to 66 permits in a given year. But after five years, that's almost 250 docks. So that's one way to show the number of cumulative, the number of projects. But then if you look at our database and try to up the cumulative impacts from the, the square footage from those 45 docks in that five-year period that leads to potential to directly impact eelgrass um, about 0.13 acres and there's a potential of half an acre of shading impacts and while it doesn't sound like those numbers are very high from what we know at DMF doing eelgrass restoration it's a pretty challenging um, thing to do and Eelgrass is a really important habitat and it's been declining along Massachusetts. So we really wanna work on avoiding any impacts first. And then similarly to salt marsh, these direct impacts from these docks have led to about a quarter acre of potential direct impacts um, and 2.4 potential shading impacts. And then in summary, um, I just wanted to go over once again and kind of emphasize that a single dock sounds pretty small when you're comparing it to a dredge project or a marina project, but it's important to think of the dock, um, dock projects as a whole and kind of consider the issues caused by the proliferation of docks on a community. And so, um, and to try to keep in mind what the indirect impacts of all these docks may be. So we'll continue to recommend to avoid, minimize, and mitigate these impacts. 
Um, but it's really up to the permitting agencies to kind of relay that information and try to include any points in the permits that they issue um, to avoid impacting these habitats. But also I just wanted to let you know that we're here if you ever need any more support from us. Um, we've in the past, we've included some of these maps that I've shown you to certain CONCOM agents. Um, so we're happy to do that. And if you ever need more support from us, um, feel free to email us at any time. And with that, I will hand it off to John Logan. Thanks, Kate. Let me just uh, get myself set up here. All right, um, so for the next part of this presentation, I'm gonna actually cover two topics fairly, fairly quickly on each one. Uh, the first portion of the talk will be looking at some recent scientific studies that MassDMF conducted about five years ago. So it's looking back at some, some work that we've already completed. And the second part, we'll be talking about a, a, a guidance document that's not quite done. So it's a bit more of a, of a preview of a, a best management practice guidance document MassDMF has been working on. Uh, realistically hoping to get that out the door um, ready for prime time, probably this upcoming spring. Um, so to go back to the slide that Jill showed to start the presentation, uh, I just wanted to focus in on the salt marsh habitat specifically, just as a reminder of, of what we're talking about. So in that overall image that Jill showed, it's this area um, that's boxed here in, in dark blue. And again, this is that intertidal habitat. So it's the area that gets flooded with every, uh, pretty much with every high tide, but at every low tide, it's, it's left fully exposed and in the dry. Um, and then within this area, there's, as you can see in this picture, there, there are a variety of salt tolerant vegetation that, that you can find, but uh, to simplify it really by and large, the vast majority of the vegetation in this area in Massachusetts is occupied by one of two species. So in the lower end, uh, closer to the, to the water itself, you find Spartina alterniflora, which is commonly known as cord grass. That's the much taller grass that typically lines your creek edges and also the, the edge of uh, various waterways. And then on the other end of the extreme, um, as you up towards the upland, you have what's called Spartina patens, also known as salt hay. And again, this, this tends to occupy the more, the more prime real estate for, for plants at least. It's the area that really only gets flooded during the higher high tides in a given month. So all of these vegetation combined provide a whole variety of ecosystem services, which is why they're, we consider them to be so important. Now, again, they're in this intertidal area. So they, they occupy this really critical space, this, this buffer between land and sea. And by occupying this space, they really uh, provide key services for both ends, right? So in terms of the upland, they provide important erosion control. And then in terms of the waterway, they act as a filter. So they keep a lot of uh, pollutants and um, perhaps excess nutrients coming off the upland from actually making their way into the waterway. So those are two of the more key ecosystem services. Then finally, you know, from a fishery standpoint, they provide habitat for a whole variety of, of fish and invertebrate species. Now, the unfortunate news, um, again, because they occupy this, this intertidal area between land and sea, unfortunately, that's the same area that a, a person needs to get across with their dock to get access to a local waterway. And so because of this, there are quite a few docks in the state that have been built at least partly over, over salt marsh. Uh, about four or five years ago, we actually went on Google Earth and, and counted the number. And believe it or not, it was well over 2,700 docks. And as Kate just showed you a few slides ago, that number is increasing every year. So it really should, I guess, should be 2,700 and counting. Um, so they're, they're, they're only getting, getting to be more and more docks over the marsh. In terms of impacts, uh, there's a variety of ways that docks can negatively impact salt marsh, but really the biggest one and the most widespread one is shading. So quite simply put, the combination of dock decking, uh, pile supports and other structural components all block some component of lights from getting to the underlying vegetation. This can relight. Depending on the degree of shading, this can result in the complete loss of salt marsh or, or at least the thinning of the grass, which can have other, other ecosystem impacts. So for, for a variety of reasons, because A, because these docks are so, so commonplace over salt marsh and B, because it's such an important resource, we decided a few years ago, it was worthwhile to conduct a few studies to look specifically at um, shading impacts of docks on salt marsh ultimately with a goal of trying to identify some dock designs that would perhaps avoid or at the very least minimize these shading impacts. I'm gonna briefly describe these two studies now in the next few slides. The first of these two is something we conducted in Marshfield, Massachusetts um, in a parcel of land owned by the state. And for this first study, we actually built our own mini private, mini docks. So all of these docks are, are 12 feet long by four feet wide. We basically built them in, in three sizes in terms of height, right? So we had, 
Uh, the one closest to you in, in this image, these were our short docks. They were set two feet off the marsh platform. That translates, because they're a four-foot dock, that translates to a 0 0.5 to one height to width ratio. Our intermediate docks were set four feet off the marsh platform. That translates to a one-to-one -one ratio. And that's an important uh, baseline, as, as some of you or many of you may know, that's kind of the current um, threshold that's usually permitted in the state. So at the state and federal level of permitting, it, it's usually pushed to have docks set basically at this height. And then finally, our tallest docks were set above that threshold. So they were six feet above the marsh, which translates to a one and a half to one height to width ratio. And so for all these docks, we set them up over the marsh for three consecutive growing seasons. And during this time, we monitored light levels under the docks as well as marsh growth. And then we compared them to nearby areas where there were no docks at all to see what it, it, it control, that's essentially our control. So what does it look like if you didn't put a dock in there at all? While that work was going on, we also went around the state and actually surveyed um, real private docks. So we went up and down the state, all of the red dots in that image show the systems where we collected um, dock samples. And it was, we were able to get to over 200 docks. And the nice thing about this part of the study was with that large sample size, we're able to look at a variety of different dock design characteristics. So, so just like the first study, we were able to look at different dock heights. But in addition to that, um, we also looked at um, different dock widths, different dock decking types. So when I say different decking types, it's pretty much your standard plank decking versus different types of alternative grading decking, which are typically actually put in place for the express purpose of, of increasing light penetration. And then finally, we also looked at docks with different orientations and different ages. So docks that were recently constructed versus ones that have been there perhaps for decades. All right, to briefly summarize the findings of these two studies, uh, to start with the first one, the, the experimental work we did in Marshfield. Um, as we uh, hypothesized, uh, both light levels and the total amount of marsh increased with increasing dock height. So those three sizes that we, that we looked at each significantly differed in terms of light levels and also marsh growth. An important thing to point out, so those intermediate docks, which were set pretty much right at the threshold is currently permitted, the one-to-one -one height to width, uh, they still had enough shading that about half of the marsh under those docks disappeared after the three-year study. So relative to a control area with no docks, we had about half as much marsh in those, in those dock footprints. Finally, the tallest docks that we looked at, which were set at one and a half to one, they allowed much more light than the one-to-one -one, uh, docks, and they also had marsh that was really comparable to the areas with no docks at all. So you were actually approaching a, a, a case where there's really no detectable impact at that height level. For the statewide survey, once again, height, uh, or if you want to look at, look at it as height to width, turned out to be the main factors that influenced both light levels and marsh growth. Um, in addition, we also found that orientation was important. So docks set closer to a north-south orientation um, had both greater light levels and also greater marsh growth relative to ones that were set closer to an east-west orientation. And finally, this, this last result was perhaps a bit surprising. The Collectively, when we looked at all of the docks that had alternative decking, so any type of grading that was not traditional plank decking, we did not see any difference in terms of light levels or marsh growth relative to the tra traditional decking. So we didn't provide any evidence that this is actually acting uh, as a mitigating factor to control for things like um, dock height or width. And finally, uh, just, just to point out again, as I mentioned earlier, both of these studies have been completed and, and published in a scientific journal. And if you're interested in kind of getting more into the details of either study, they're both freely available on the mass.gov website. So both links are included here. And I encourage you to download them and give them a closer look. Um, for the second part of my part of the presentation, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be focusing more on work that's that's still being um, completed. And to look more, not just at salt marsh now, but to look at salt marsh, eelgrass, as well as other marine resources, and how dock BMPs can be put in place to minimize or avoid impacts to these resources. The picture I have up here in this slide is, is the cover page to a, a document that Mass DEP put out in 2003. Uh, many of you may be familiar, familiar with this document. It was there's a guidance on BMPs for small dock and pier um, development in Massachusetts. And if you don't have this, I highly recommend downloading it. There's a link on this underneath the picture here, also from mass.gov. Um, it's, it's been really a valuable resource for our agency. Uh, MassDMF has really used this resource um, to guide a lot of our, our recommendations and our comment letters. But as good as, of a document as it is, um, the reality is uh, science progresses and uh, we learn more over time and it's now approaching uh, the science that, that that document's based on is now nearly 20 years old. So uh, we decided a few years ago that it, it made sense, enough time had passed and enough new science had come to light that we thought it made sense to, to sort of provide an update to this document. So we've been working now for a couple of years internally on a, 
pretty comprehensive re review document looking at uh, the impacts of docks and floats on aquatic ecosystems, and also trying to provide a, a condensed best management practice guidelines um, for avoidance and minimization. Um, again, this document is not done yet, but it should be coming soon. I've included my email address here. So for anyone that's interested, uh, we certainly plan once we do have a final product to really spread it widely to all the permitting agencies. But um, if you're interested on the updates on the progress of the project or just want to make sure that you get yourself a personal copy, certainly feel free to reach out to me. This slide here shows uh, both a horizontal and a planned view of, of a theoretical dock. And uh, in the next few slides, I'll sort of walk, walk you through step by step of the, of the different components of these, of these two images. But I just wanted to show these up there to start because these are kind of, really this one image can kind of summarize many of our BMP recommendations in, in one single image. But again, I'll, I'll walk through these piece by piece so it's a little e easier to follow. I'm first to look at, at that overhead plan view with regards to salt marsh and eelgrass. And I just wanted to take one slide just to make the, the overarching point that um, sometimes we, we get lost in the, in the BMPs and maybe sometimes mistakenly think that it's, you know, a dock is permitted with all the best conditions in place, that it's, it's you've done the best you can, you're avoiding impacts. But at least with regards to salt marsh and eelgrass, anytime a dock is built over these two resources, it realistically, there's probably going to be some level of impact, even if it's a really well-designed dock. So it really, an important point here is just that when avoidance is an option, it's always gonna be your really your only guaranteed way of making sure that you're actually gonna avoid impacts. So physical avoidance is what's really needed to avoid any sort of um, resource impacts. And again, this office and it's not feasible, but uh, it's important to at least consider this because there can be cases in a given um, dock situation where you might be able to creatively site the dock in an area that doesn't touch either of these resources. So in this, in this theoretical image here, you know, sometimes you'll see in the fringing marsh, there might be a natural gap where you could fit a walkway through without shading any marsh. And similarly, the eelgrass may very well not encompass all of the deep water in that property. So there may be a, an opportunity to put that float outside of the eelgrass bed. And finally, just while I have this the same slide up from the same plan view, as I mentioned from our salt marsh studies, we found that, that orientation is important for, for light penetration and by association for, for plant growth. So, Anytime you do have to put a, put a dock structure over either of these um, types of vegetation, we highly recommend, again, if feasible, to put it in a north-south orientation. Now to look specifically at the decking component of the dock, um, a few things to point out in terms of our BMPs. Again, this is now based upon our own science, so the studies I just described earlier. Uh, if the dock has to go over salt marsh, we're currently recommending that the height to width for that portion of the dock be a minimum of one and a half to one. So again, that comes directly from our own science. If the dock, the decking component of the dock can't avoid eelgrass, we're recommending the height be at least 10 feet above the seafloor. That also comes directly from, uh, from uh, science. Uh, a study done in, by Burdick and Short in 1999, they looked at uh, floats in Wapoint Bay and Falmouth and also in Nantucket Harbor. And they found that the dock really had to be at least 10 feet above the, the seafloor to minimize impacts to eelgrass. So that's our current minimum threshold. And then one other point to, to note here in terms of this theoretical dock, um, as Kate mentioned earlier, the, the, the pile footprint represents direct impact. So really working with the, the consultant and their engineers to make sure that the number of piles and the size of piles is minimized to, to minimize that direct impact is, is really key. And another important point in this, in this image is that you'll notice none of these piles fall directly on these two sensitive resource areas. So if it's possible within the design constraints of the dock in terms of the actual structure, have the piles go outside of eelgrass and salt marsh, that of course will avoid direct impacts. To shift seaward to the floats, a few things to point out here. Um, we recommend that the float certainly avoid the intertidal habitat so that it can avoid grounding during low tides. But beyond that, we recommend that it's in deep enough water. Uh, in this case, we recommend a, a minimum of two and a half feet at, at an average low tide below the float. And this recommendation actually comes directly from that previous mass DEP um, docking pier guidance document. And the rationale behind this depth is that the thought is, is, is twofold. One, it's, it's deep enough to allow circulation under the float at all tides. And two, the theory is at least for smaller motorized vessels that it should be deep enough to avoid any sort of direct propeller scouring for that underlying habitat. Um, and again, like the piles, like the decking, minimizing the float will just minimize any sort of direct shading impact. And for eelgrass, unfortunately, uh, what little science is available currently doesn't provide any, any key um, design constraints that will minimize impacts to eelgrass from a float. So the, the shading impacts seem to be great enough 
That burdick and short study that I mentioned earlier, they looked at floats and really found no floats that um, allow eelgrass to persist. To my knowledge, there's one other study that was done in Sweden on eelgrass in, in that area and that found similar results. So uh, perhaps Barbara's study that she'll describe next might, might shed some more light on this, but uh, in, in the absence of those sorts of data, we're, we're adopting a precautionary approach. And in this case, we recommend that uh, the float itself just avoid eelgrass to avoid any of that likely shading and, and scouring impact. And finally, this is my last slide to describe our, our BMP document. And for this last slide, this is the last section of that document that we're working on. It is sort of more of a, a big picture and a bit more of an outside the box component to the, to the, to the paper. And um, both Jill and Kate kind of talked on, uh, touched on a few of these issues earlier, but really, um, yeah, Jill mentioned a few of these, a uh, few towns have done this, but developing your own bylaws really seems to be a great way to ensure that whatever BMPs you think are really important get adopted as a standard across the board for your whole town, right? So if there's a tide above salt marsh you think is important, if there's cultural resources like shellfish flash you think should be avoided, um, putting this into your bylaws is a great way to make sure that it gets enforced, not just for occasional docks, but for all docks in your town. And relatedly, um, it's more on the outside the box thinking component is just, you know, consider ways where you can just avoid uh, all these docks being constructed. So um, Jill mentioned a, a nice case study where there was really more of a community dock approach where two docks turned into one. Um, there could also be cases where perhaps uh, there may be nearby boat ramps may, that may save the same, serve the same purpose. Uh, moorings may also be a more environmentally friendly way of allowing people to have uh, boat access to a waterway. And finally, I, I just want to put up a, a few nice uh, references here. Um, Sandy McFarland and others did some really great work down in Pleasant Bay where they actually developed um, some guidelines where they really inventoried that whole system, identified areas that were really full of uh, sensitive resources they felt were required protection. And those areas simply through their, their bylaws just were blocked from having any further docks being constructed. So taking this approach and uh, really to look at the big picture might be your best way of getting at some of those, some of those cumulative impacts. And that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Barbara, where she's going to talk a bit more now about her an upcoming eelgrass study that she is currently working on. Thank you. Hey, John. Yes. Uh, before Barbara, we've got two questions real quick. Sure. Um, number one, um, minimizing pile footprint. What is your view on a uni pile or single pile design? Is it less impactful? It's a good question. I, it should be in theory, but uh, it, it kind of depends, right? So if that uni pile has to be so big that the footprint would actually be greater than multiple piles, then it, it's a bit tricky. I, I would say uh, as a blanket statement, probably yes, but just be careful if that's proposed to see just how big those uni piles will be. I mean, it, it's going to be a reduced, uh, I guess the the surface area should be reduced, right? So in terms of that scouring around it, you may have a reduced impact relative to a couple smaller piles, but it kind of depends on how big they are, in my opinion. Um, the next one real quick, uh, most of the projects we see are boardwalks with seasonal docks and a coastal great pond that is manually open to the ocean. So it is not always tidal. We have been using a four and a half foot off the salt marsh, but this requirement has presented design issues and complaints about aesthetics. Any suggestions? Sadly, there's no eelgrass in Tisbury Great Pond, just salt marsh. The last two designs have used seasonal pipe piling. Any thoughts on design? Yeah, I mean, the first point, that's something we encounter a lot when we're providing comments is that aesthetic issue, right? So there are a lot of towns that don't want the docks to be high up. It's more high profile, easier to see. Um, I don't really have any good aesthetic solutions, unfortunately. This is sort of outside of our, our area of expertise. Um, all I can say in terms of supporting that is just to use the science. You know, it's um, again to go back to the, to the papers I described earlier. There is pretty compelling evidence that height is definitely your, your best tool for minimizing impact to that salt marsh. So it may unfortunately come at the cost of, of your, your your view of the of the area, but it. On the, on the flip side, it results in, in greater marsh preservation. So I, I, you can certainly use science as your tool. Um, the aesthetic end of things, I, I kind of can't help you there. Um, I, there's another question about pipe piles. Is that right? Uh, that was part of it, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, you know, smaller piles is certainly certainly preferable. Um, so if you can get away with a smaller pile footprint, then yeah, for sure, we definitely recommend that. Okay, um, there is another question, but for the sake of time, we're gonna let Barbara um, do her part of the presentation, and then we'll get to um, some questions afterwards. If anyone needs to leave, I understand. Uh, just let me know.
And uh, go ahead, Barbara. I think you're muted. Yes, yes, sorry. I'll start over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've been listening about salt marsh and uh, eelgrass, and I'm sure as, as commissioners, you're hopefully all well aware of the importance of these marine habitats or eelgrass as a marine habitat. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to really stress is that it is submerged in Massachusetts. Jill started us off with that. Uh, we see the picture of Div Division Marine Fishery Divers. Um, it's, a, it's a nursery habitat. It provides food for fish and invertebrates. It's really critical for our commercial fisheries. Uh, it provides that role for nutrient cycling, getting rid of that phosphorus and the, nutrient, the nitrogen that we have issues with. Um, and then it protects our coast. You know, it da dampens the wave, reduces beach erosion. All these things are important to, to um, our communities. And then with climate change, we are, there are more and more studies showing how it sequesters carbon and actually can modify um, ocean acidification. So very important habitat that we want to protect. Uh, let me go forward. Nope. Okay, it's not, there you go. Just a little slow. Uh, so I'm with Salem Sound Coast Watch. We're uh, a an, uh, NGO. Uh, we've been around for 30 years, uh, protecting, uh, working to protect the water quality and the habitats around Salem Sound. Uh, we've done countless uh, outreach on the importance of eelgrass, and, uh, and we still need to be doing that. Uh, we've engaged our volunteers. People love to go out and help in these ways, planting eelgrass. There's uh, actually Kate is the, the one with the sunglasses on um, about 10 years ago. She and I brought all, all these uh, volunteers together, uh, threaded eelgrass um, into these burlap discs, and then they were planted out in um, off of Winter Island. Uh, we've also worked with uh, Manchester by the Sea and Beverly Harbor Masters to put in uh, conservation moorings. So you'll see the bottom right picture, you'll see the boats and the little black, uh, white dot as the mooring ball. And then you'll see what we call the, the, um, the mooring donut, or you can see the white area that is um, where the eelgrass has been removed from the, by the chain action. Uh, there, the set middle picture is everybody looking at this new conservation mooring and um, a, a diagram of it. Um, I know, uh, was it Kate that showed a picture of it not quite working right? Uh, we will be following up with this and be giving advice to um, our communities uh, on what, what better management, everything needs to be maintained. And so we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to give you this information. But as we see, we've been doing all these things, we're still seeing the increase in recreational boating. And that means more docks, more floats and more moorings. So over 20 years in our four harbors, uh, we've seen an 18% increase in boat moorings. But if you sort of zero in on that, you will see that Marblehead experienced 45% of that 18%. And those moorings were mainly on the west shore of Marblehead, which is the west side of Salem Harbor. And in 10 year time between 1995 and 2016, um, Salem Harbor experienced a 53% hillgrass loss. Um, and here's a, another photo. We've been seeing a lot about Marblehead, but um, you can see in the green circles, the floats out there and sort of the white halo uh, around the docks um, where the eelgrass um, it has disappeared. We have uh, over 30 docks uh, in the area. So uh, Salem Sound Coast Watch applied to the Mass Bay's uh, Healthy Estuary Grant, and we received funding this fall to look at solutions to protect eelgrass. And we're really looking at it being a cooperative guidance um, for docks and, and then the auxiliary uh, recreational boating. The, our study area, the picture in um, up in the, uh, the Mass Bay assessment area is the diagram on the left. And uh, you'll see the, all the coastline from Mass Bays. Um, and then the arrow of the bottom picture with a purple, that's the eelgrass um, acoustic uh, eelgrass map from 2016. 
And then if we go over to the larger picture from Morris, you'll see um, where our study site is. So we'll be working along the coastline where there are these 31 docks. And it's a lot of it is also chapter 91. Uh, we are doing a multi-pronged approach. Um, the next few slides will cover these four items. Um, so I'm not gonna read them in the, um, we'll be talking about them in a minute. So the first one is to look at um, the, what, what's uh, called the DOC uh, eelgrass calculator. Um, John mentioned um, the uh, Fred Short and Dave Burdick papers. So we uh, looked at those in 2009 um, they actually created uh, and uh, uh, honed um, their, uh, their calculator uh, with the idea that you could sort of pop in numbers here and get an idea of how it's going to impact eelgrass. And so this is our worst case. We've got a dock height of four. Um, the, the dock is wide and we've got it um, east-west rather than north-south. And you'll see the zero. We've got an eelgrass bed, meaning there's no eelgrass there. Uh, if we change it a little bit, we got we lowered our dock height, uh, kept the um, the width. Um, we we we, look, we made it more uh, narrower. Um, we got a one, but the one means there's no eelgrass under the dock, but there is some adjacent to the dock. And of course, the best one would be a ten foot height, um, a wide a, a narrower dock for and it going north, south. And so it feels very much like uh, eelgrass is responding the same way the salt marsh is. They both need light. So what we are gonna be doing is, um, we're, right now we're collecting all the data on these docks um, and it's taking us some time to do that. And we're going to um, put the numbers into the deck calculator so we get the prediction. Um, and then next summer, we knew when we applied that this was a uh, COVID time. So uh, we did most of our field work, left it for next year. Uh, we are going to do high resolution monitoring of the eelgrass and we're gonna look at associated structures. So uh, Division Marine Fisheries is going to be doing some side scans, acoustic surveys for us. Um, and then we're gonna get DMF and EPA divers to go out and do underwater photography and a more fine scale survey uh, to ground truth, the acoustic mapping um, for a subset of docks and floats. Uh, we'll be collecting um, eelgrass metrics, presence, absence, percent coverage, maybe some other things. And then uh, what we've uh, started testing out uh, this fall is we're putting light sensors um, on the picture on the left, you see one of our interns uh, are we, you know, we're using a screw anchor or we're using a bucket and a PVC pipe, but all of them will have a Hobie light and uh, temperature pennant on it. Uh, we're putting them on one on the dock for our reference. We'll put them um, under the dock and then in the nearby eelgrass, and then we'll be able to compare that. Because light is critically essential, as we've been hearing all afternoon uh, for these um, habitats. Um, and it, you know, they have extensive root systems. Um, they re re reproduce by rhizomes and seeds. They, um, as Jill said, they, it was a, it's a grass plant that evolved back into the marine environment. Uh, we're also going to research dock guidelines and regulations. Um, so the, the Fred Short and uh, Dave Burdick paper, as far as we know, the only um, states that have uh, implemented their guidelines was Rhode Island and Florida. So we'll be reaching out to them and getting some um, how, how's it going kind of advice. Um, and then we will be looking at um, different dock types. And um, this is the first time I'd heard from John saying that the, um, the dock um, material that's like on the left here uh, wasn't making a difference. So we'll see if with Rhode Island, I know they have to do a lot of this in Florida, if they're finding that's making a difference. It turns out we have one dock in Marblehead that um, has a, is not made of wood, has some kind of trans, uh, more open space uh, spacing. So hopefully we'll get the um, dock uh, owner to, uh, to agree to work with us and maybe we can do um, put the light sensors under their dock as well as some other docks. 
And we're here, we're gonna be reaching out uh, to learn from the um, town conservation commissions and the planning boards uh, to see, to hear what you're doing, uh, your frustrations. And as I was putting these together, uh, this uh, presentation together, I was thinking, um, you know, I'd like your feedback on whether you would uh, participate in a survey uh, sometime as, so we can get to some of these um, underlying issues. Because in the end, we want to share um, all our lessons learned. Uh, we want to communicate with recreational boaters and dock owners and harbor masters, of course, the conservation commissioners and planning boards. And we hope that we will be able to come back uh, next year uh, when the, um, the study is finished and actually give you what we found, give us, uh, give you um, our research. Uh, we will be hopefully doing some online webinars and um, putting everything we've done in a story map, which is a great way to communicate to communities. Uh, and we will include in that some um, conservation mooring information. So um, that is our uh, contact information. And I know that you're all getting uh, a PDF um, with this in it. And there was one more slide. I don't know whether you, yeah. Yeah, Jill wants to take that over. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Barbara, Kate, John. Um, for sure, spending the time with all of us and all of the listeners. As Barbara said, uh, if you don't already have a PDF of the slides, that'll be available to you. The final slide in that is going to have any reference that was included in the entire talk all um, summarized on one slide. So with that, um, Joey, I'm not sure if you've been able to keep an eye on the chat box and have any questions lined up for us. Otherwise, I um, yeah, I do have one, um, but if you haven't sent the most recent slide deck PDF to Michelle, um, just please do so. Um, there is one here from uh, Nantucket. Applicants have argued that a dock is okay over a gap in a formal in a former eelgrass meadow. Mm -hmm. If there's no EG, then no impact. What do you think? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, that's a great question. So a former eelgrass meadow indicates to us that conditions were suitable at one point or another for eelgrass growth. Um, eelgrass can extent and condition can vary greatly from year to year, depending on environmental conditions and weather and so on. And uh, it's reasonable to think that an area that once supported eelgrass could once again, um, if the seed source is available, so it's important, DMF and mass bays and many others do feel it's important to protect historic eelgrass habitat as much as current existing. And I, I would just add, just remember the picture that Jill showed us uh, where because we had the docks, there was, there was there, the, the eelgrass had become very patchy. So I think you really wanna look at the history of the eelgrass and, and, and the impacts that have, have uh, damaged it. All right, well, this was a fantastic uh, presentation, um, a lot of information, and it's so fascinating. Um, and I hope that uh, everyone that joined us got, um, you know, quite a bit of information out of it and some insight. Um, clearly, these are, are four great professionals uh, in their field and um, in your uh in your right in front of you is their information, but it'll be in your information packet uh, slide deck when you do receive it in the next week uh, or so. Um, but if there are no other questions, um, you know, um, and you think of something uh, tomorrow when you don't have to sit in a conference, <laughs> send an email to one of these folks and say, hey, I just thought of this. So. I'm sure they'll. Uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. So, I want to thank all four of you. Thank you so much, Jeremy um, from Ty and Bond as a co-host. Thank you so much, um, and once again, thank you to MET as a supporter. And um, I want to um, just uh, wish everyone a uh, very uh, safe and uh, happy rest of the fall. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.